Welcome to another video. Let's use the gamma function to carry out an integration. Before now, I have avoided using special functions to evaluate any integral because I wanted to have gone over how, how the special function came about before I used them. So now I can go back to those MIT integration B problems and use them, use the gamma function to evaluate them. So this is a problem that we're going to start with. And this problem is actually filled with algebra tricks and almost no calculus. Well, the mother of the gamma function is calculus. So we're just going to say we've done all the calculus with the gamma function. We're just going to use it to evaluate this. Let's get into the video. So I'm going to start by writing the gamma function or maybe the pi function. Just you choose whichever one you want and we're going to use it to evaluate this. So what does the gamma function tell us we need? Well, you know that the gamma of x plus 1 is equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of, um, let's use t this time, t to the x, or let's do z. So let me not use x, let me use z, since that is the general way of defining the gamma function. So let's do t to the z, e to the negative t dt. This is how we define the gamma of anything. So the gamma of z plus 1 will be the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the z. So whatever is here, if you add 1 to it and put it in the gamma function as the argument, that's what you're evaluating. Now, this little thing confuses a lot of people. So the pi function is a much cleaner one because it's the shifted version of what we have here. So the pi function just shows you that whatever is here is what's going to be on top here. And that I like better. Okay, so the pi function says that the pi of z is equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the z e to the negative t dt. Now this makes a lot more sense because what you have as the argument here is what is the argument of the pi function. So you can treat you can treat this as the shifted version of this, but it doesn't matter. We'll still get the same answer. So what do you need to do? All you have to do is look at the integral you have, try to rewrite it to look like this. If it looks like this, you've got your answer. If it doesn't look like this, you don't have an answer. So not every integration can be done using the gamma function, but some of them are just meant for the gamma function. So let's rewrite this to fit into one of these two profiles and we'll get our answer. What I'm going to do now is do all kinds of substitutions so I can rewrite this to look like this. So the first thing I'm going to do is decide which part of this is my u for my u substitution. And this one looks a bit um, scary. So we're going to make this our u and see what comes out of it. So let's say let u be equal to ln of 1 over x. And what that means is if I take the e of both sides, this implies that e to the u will be equal to 1 over x. And that means if I flip this, it's going to be e to the negative u will be x. If you take the reciprocal of both of them, you're going to have e to the negative u is equal to x. Keep this in mind. We're going to come back to it. Now for this one, u is equal to ln of 1 over x. We need to take the derivative. So we got to find du. du will be equal to the derivative of ln of 1 over x. Well, remember the derivative of any ln, ln of 1 over x. If you take the derivative, it is always the derivative of the argument, which is going to be negative 1 over x squared divided by the argument 1 over x. 
And to simplify this, you just need to multiply the top and bottom by x squared. So if I multiply this by x squared, see what comes out. This cancels this, I have negative one on top. This cancels one of this, I have x. So it's negative one over x. So this is gonna be negative one over x dx. Okay, now, but it looks like one over x is e to the u. We don't want anything in terms of x anymore. Remember, we're doing a u substitution. So one over x is e to the u. So we can easily say that du is equal to negative e to the u dx. But we want this u to be on this side. So we can say this implies that if we divide both sides by negative e to the u, we can say that dx is equal to negative e to the negative u du. That's it, that's our new dx. Okay, so let's go here. All the things we need to change. We need to replace natural log of one over x. We need to replace x, we need to replace this. We need to replace dx, we have all of that, but we need to change the bounds, okay? So we're gonna say that when x is equal to zero, what will u be? What will u be when x is equal to zero? We go here, okay? So when u, when x is zero, we're gonna have the natural log of one over zero. Now, the natural log of one over zero is expected to be infinity or negative infinity, or usually we say it is undefined. But in this case, it is defined because, not defined in that in the sense of Defined, defined on the real line, but we know what direction it's going because you can only approach zero right from the right hand side. That's from one, you go towards zero. So it means you're approaching zero from the right. And if approaching zero only from one direction, you can take a one sided limit and you know that this is positive infinity. That's what your limit is. And that's what you're going to get as the natural log of zero when you I mean natural log of one over zero approaching from the right of zero okay we do the same thing u of what's the of other one one it's going to be the natural log of one over one well we know this is ln of one which is equal to zero so we're done with all the computation or all the substitutions now we need to do the replacement so what we have is that the integral we're working with is now going from we're going to replace this with infinity and replace the top with zero. Okay, now bit by bit, this is x cubed. x cubed is going to be, what is x? This is x. So it's gonna be e to the negative u cubed. Then we're gonna have um, the square root. Actually this square root, I wanna write it as raised to power one half, okay? And the square root is x multiplied by the natural log of one over x. So what is x? e to the negative u multiplied by natural log of one over x. That's u. Nice. Then we have dx. What did we say dx was again? Right here. Negative e to the negative u du. Negative e to the negative u du. Okay, now that looks a bit messy and scattered, but when we put everything together, it looks juicy. Let's go. So, let's just do this at once. This is e to the negative. Okay, this negative sign can come all the way to the back, right? So we can put the negative sign here, but the negative sign can help us flip the bounds of this integral. So what we have now is from zero to infinity. See that? So the first and most important thing going from zero to infinity has been discovered and that is settled. We now need to work on the inside. Remember the goal is to make it look like this. So what else? We have e to the negative u. We got, so let's put all of them together. This is gonna be e to the negative three u. Let's do the rough work here. So this is e to the negative three u. 
This, when this half comes in here, it's going to be e to the negative half u. That's times e to the negative u over 2. And then there's one here, e to the negative u. By the laws of exponents, we can just add up all of these. This is going to be 3, 4, and this is going to be 4 and a half. So it's going to be 9 halves, negative 9 halves u. So this is going to be e to the negative 9u over 2. That's what we have here. And we're going to have u to the 1 half here. u to the 1 over 2 here. And then we're going to have du. Okay, this is the integral that we're supposed to evaluate. Almost there. But it just does not look like this. Okay? This could be u. See, if we had negative one thing here and that thing raised to power a number, then we know we're done with our calculation. But it doesn't look... This is good. But this is not good. We need to make this one thing. Let's replace it. So I'm going to replace it with t and see what comes out of it. So we're going to do another u substitution. Ah, t be equal to 9u over 2. Which means u is 2, 2 over 9t. Okay, so that means 2 over 9t equals u. And if you take the derivative of both sides, you'll see that 2 over 9 dt equals du. So I already know what to replace this with. I'll replace du with 2 over 9 dt. Okay, what else? Oh, I need to change this. So u has to be replaced. What will u be? Oh, we already got u. Nice. Now, we need to change the boundaries or check them to see if there's any change. Well, what will t be when u equals 0? Well, it's going to be 9 times 0 over 2, which is still 0. Okay, so that does not change. We, we check for infinity also. What will t be when u is infinity? It's going to be 9 times infinity over 2. That's still infinity. So it looks like we've gotten everything that we need. We know what t is. We know how to replace u. We know du. We know the bounds. We're ready. So we can say the integral that we're dealing with is the integral starting from 0 to infinity. And the first part is the square root of u. What is u again? u is 2 over 9t. So we're going to take the square root of 2 over 9 times t, but we're going to separate this t and write it as 1 half. So we take the square root of everything here, and we're going to multiply by e to the negative t times e to the negative t, and then we're going to multiply by du, and we said du is what? 2 over 9 dt. 2 over 9 dt. Okay, ah, let's take care of all the constants and pull them all the way to the back. There are two constants here. There is 2 over 9 and square root of 2 over square root of 9. Well, we know. Let's do the math here. The square root of 2 over square root of 9 times 2 over 9 is going to be square root of 2 over, what's the square root of 9? 3 times 2 over 9. So if we take care of this, you notice that we're going to get 2 square root of 2 divided by 27. And this is going to be in the back. So we have i equals 2 square root of 2 divided by 27. Nice. And our integral now just looks very, very good. Look, we have t to the one-half e to the negative t dt. This is the definition of the factorial of one-half. Because if we use the pi function, this is what we get. We get that the gamma 
of negative 1 over 2 plus 1, that's what's going to give us this. It's going to be equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the, what's negative 1 half plus 1? That's just be 1 half. And that's e to the negative t dt. Now, if, if this confuses you, that's why this is there. Just plug it in. The factorial of 1 half is this integral t to the 1 half e to the negative t dt. Personally, I'm a fan of the pi function for factorials because it's just easy for me to see what I'm doing. What is here is what is here. If you use the gamma function, you have to shift it to the left by one unit. And that's why you have to, this is now the factorial of, I mean, then factorial of one half has to be written as negative one half plus one. So this is just the better option. And we've done in a previous video, we know what this answer is. It is the square root of pi over two. Say this is one half. factorial and it's equal to the square root of pi divided by 2. So when we multiply this by this, this 2 will take care of this 2 and I can actually combine these two radicals so it becomes square root of 2 pi over 27. This is the value that's the exact value of this definite integral. Never stop learning. Those who stop learning, stop living. Bye-bye.